Babylon news Some geeks and their tough crew All the vessels were askew And hot dogs can't be true Cause we sacrificed their everything So we decided they can't stay I won't let them take it away from me Started to defile. We were in total denial, and we cried every day. You kept us away, but now we're tired of your sins. So you might as well give in, and we'll get down to evicting you at last. Temple I knew Said some Greeks in their tough crew All the vessels were askew And I thought this can't be true Cause oh, I'll pray to you And I'll fight for you Shlomo Phillips here from allfaith.com. Am Yisrael Chai. We say that all the time, but we have a bit of a problem because we don't know, we don't agree on who is Yisrael. I've touched on this topic several different times um, from various angles, and I've actually talked about this one before too. But this is a piece that I wrote for the Kairite section of AllFaith.com, and it's called A Natural Born Jew, Patrilineal and Matrilineal Descent. I initially wrote this um, on July 11th, 2016. If you're joining me on Facebook, which I know a few people are, um... I would invite you to comment if you have any questions. Ahuva, would you mind logging into my Facebook? Ahuva, would you log into my Facebook? Someone says they can't hear me. I want to make sure the sound's working over there. She thinks it's her speakers, but I just want to make sure it's not my broadcast. We at various times have had problems with our, with our Facebook feed, so it's good to just make sure it may not be your speakers at all. So let's see if uh, Huva can hear me coming through her speakers, and she can. Okay, I think it is probably your speakers. Um, Hope you can get those working so that you'll be able to hear the broadcast. If not, the broadcast is repeated, but um, we will see how that goes for you. I want to welcome Kale. I want to welcome Twy Pinhawk. 
I want to welcome Veronica, Ronnie, and Ikal, and Kifa, and all the others who are joining in to watch. You know, you would think that after a little over 3,500 years, Jews would be able to answer one basic question. Who is a Jew? If you ask the question, who is an American, there's some pretty easy ways to find out. Were you born here? You're an American. Pretty easy. If you weren't born here, do you have the, the paper from the government saying that they, you're accepted as an American citizen? You're an American, right? What American means. If you're a Christian, for the most part, you have the basic beliefs the Nicene Creed and if you accept that you're a Christian of course sometimes the Protestants and Catholics will go after each other but yeah pretty much Christians agree who a Christian is Muslims agree who is a Muslim yeah some Muslims say well you're not observant enough or whatever but a Muslim is a Muslim a Buddhist is a Buddhist a Hindu is a Hindu and you don't have any question about what it means to be whatever religion you belong to and who is a co-religionist <clears throat> you may disagree on points but if you're a Christian you know who the Christians are if you're a Catholic, you know who the Catholics are, if you're a Buddhist, and so on. It's not that way in Judaism, and it really, really should be. You would think, again, that after 3,500 years of existence and of having people desperately trying to exterminate us, that Jews would be able to answer this basic question, but you'd be wrong. This question remains a major bone of contention, and it's a major bone of contention coming from several different angles. I've spent a lot of time talking about how some sects will accept a convert and other sects won't. I'm not going to talk too much about that one. Today, I want to talk about the difference between patrilineal and matrilineal descent. While historically Judaism accepts converts, <clears throat> even phrases them, within modern Judaism there's an area of much debate and contention about converts. Orthodox rabbinic conversion requirements often will divide the Jews and causes innumerable difficulties for born Jews and converted Jews alike because a born Jew is not allowed by Halakha to marry a non-Jew. If a person converts to Judaism, you should be able to marry them because the Torah is very clear that you are to make no distinction between the born Jew and the convert. But while a big section of Judaism says that the vast majority of converts today aren't really Jews, if you're a born Jew, trying to decide whether or not you can marry a person actually requires you to go back through their pedigree as far back as you can looking to confirm that they're actually Jewish. While everyone born of a Jewish mother is accepted as Jewish according to rabbinic Judaism, the Orthodox believe that only they have the religious authority to make the converts and to convert people and to establish acceptable Jewish lineages. So as I said, that means that most people who convert outside of Israel are not accepted as Jewish by the Orthodox chief rabbinates regardless of how much how committed they are to our direct no matter whether they are non-religious Jews rejecting them or religious Jews rejecting them even atheist Jews can say I'm a Jew you're not but if you're born of a Jewish mother you're accepted as fully Jewish and so everyone agrees on that right well not quite that easy when you're contrasting Kairite with Rabbinic Judaism, this is a humongous debate. It takes the most fascinating turn and not one that moves us towards unity. According to Kairite Judaism, one is a natural born Jew if one's father is Jewish, regardless of one's mother's status. This is the exact opposite position of the Rabbinic view where the mother's lineage is what determines Jewishness and not that of the father. Put more simply, according to the Kairites, if your dad is Jewish, you're Jewish, period. According to the Rabbinites, if your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish, period. Doesn't matter on the other parent. 
For this reason, traditional Judaism will accept some Kairites as Jews and not others, just like they'll accept some converts as Jews, but not others. This is all terribly confusing. Now, there's a lot more to the rabbinic and Kairite division than the question of, of, of lineage, of maternal or patriarchal uh, lineage, or patri patriarchal lineage. Um, but this is a huge one. Because if a person is a Kairite Jew, then a Kairite Jew who wants to be accepted by rabbinic Jews for some reason has to be able to demonstrate that he or she is born of a Jewish mother, regardless of what Kairite accepts, and be able to trace it back a bit even. Because if, the, if your mother wasn't born of a Jewish mother, then she's not really Jewish. And if her grandmother wasn't Jewish, then she's not really Jewish. This gets incredibly confusing, trying to figure out who is Jewish. This is among the most fundamental differences between the two Jewish sects, but as I said, it's not the only one. Rabbinic tradition teaches that Jewishness passes matrilineally through the mother, while Kairite tradition says that it is patrilineally or through the father. Um, today, in case you're not familiar with these terms, most Jews that you're ever going to meet are going to be rabbinic Jews. Uh, Kairite Judaism has one full-time synagogue in the United States. It's mainly present in other countries, mainly in Israel and Egypt. Um, and Egypt is in serious trouble because, well, we know why. Um, but because of the Internet, Kairite Judaism is actually making a bit of a comeback. I speak about this more in other sections of my Kairite, the Kairite portion of my website. But the Kairite movement is actually making a comeback because, in part, people are deciding that they cannot find a place in rabbinic Judaism. And it's the same reason why the vast majority of people convert non-Orthodox, because they don't feel they can find a place within Orthodoxy. When we consider the Torah and the rest of the Tanakh, we find something interesting, if, especially if you're a rabbinic Jew, that the lineages of Israel in the Torah, in the Tanakh, always pass from father to son, just like tribal house lineage does, as the Kairites say. But the majority of Jews today are rabbinic. How does that work? If you look at Genesis or Bereshit 11.31, you read this. And Terah took Abram, his son, this is Abraham, before he became Abraham, he was still called Avram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, who became Sarah, the wife of Avram, his son. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. And they came as far as Haran, and they settled there. If you follow all of these, so you notice it was, it was Terah brought his son. In the Torah, it's almost always referencing the father with the son or daughter. Normally, it's the son. The begots found in places like Bereshit chapter 36 always say so-and-so the son of a father, not a mother. When references are made to the sons of a mother, it's usually worded that the father gave birth to the child through the woman, and not that the child was the son of the woman. For example, look at Bereshit or Genesis 24:15. There's a few exceptions to this, but in the main, this is the case throughout the entire Tanakh. Based on this clear biblical precedent, Kairism is and remains patrilineal. They go through the father. The son or the daughter of a Jewish man is accepted by Kairism as a natural born Jew. It appears that the rabbinic change to the matrilineal reckoning began in the very earliest times during the Babylonian exile under the authority of Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly. The justification for this change is said to have been that since Jewish women were at such extreme risks of sexual violations then, and since identifying the fathers of children under such dire conditions was next to impossible, the Jewishness of the mother 
became the deciding factor in establishing one's Jewishness. The Sadducees and others rejected this change, however, away from Biblical Halakha. So we need to acknowledge the fact it was a change from Biblical Halakha. We also need to understand that we call it Rabbinic Judaism for a reason. We believe that the rabbinate, that the rabbis of our people have been given the authority by Hashem to determine how our law, how our religion and traditions are to be interpreted and passed on. Therefore, we see the rabbis making several changes. For instance, we changed the Tahalel changed the timeline of the calendar so that things would fit better into the observances of the various holidays and festivals. We believe as rabbinic Jews that the rabbis hold this authority, um, which raises a bunch of other questions when it comes to accepting Jewishness. But um, So rabbinic Judaism believes that the rabbis had the full, complete authority to make these changes. But in my opinion, we have to acknowledge it was in fact a change, that the Kairites are correct. Judaism in the Bible is a patrilineal religion, a religion that follows the line of the Father. But not all rabbinics agree with this answer. Chabad's rabbi Malki Janowski, Jan Janowski uh, finds a Torah indication for matrilineal descent at Deuteronomy 7, 3-4, where it says, You shall not intermarry with them, and you shall not give your daughter to his son, and you shall not take his daughter for your son. For this will cause your child to turn away from me, and they will worship the gods of others. Rabbi um, Janowski writes, The implication here is that children from such a union will be torn away from Judaism. That's clearly what it says. He continues, Since the verse states, quote, For he, i.e. the non-Jewish father, will cause your child to turn away, end quote, this implies that a child born to a Jewish mother is Jewish, your child, whereas if a Jewish man marries a non-Jewish woman, then that child is not Jewish. As such, there is no concern that she, the child's mother, would turn the child away from Judaism. Uh, to me, that's reaching a little bit, to be honest with you. I don't think, that's, I don't think all that is implied in that verse. When contrasted with the overwhelming number of references, however, to the passing of Jewishness through the Father and its accepted absence matrilineally in the Scripture, this answer to me seemed inconclusive at best. Patrilineal bloodlines, patrilineal through the Father bloodlines, determine whether a Jew is a Kohen, a Levite, or an Israelite, and so it seems all but certain to me that biblically at least, Jewishness is always transmitted through the father, patrilineally. Joseph was married to a non-Jewish woman, and his children were considered to be Jewish. The same was the case with Moses, King Solomon, and others. Despite the weak Orthodox attempts to support matrilineal descent biblically, this change of policy of matrilineal descent clearly came through late antiquity, and it developed gradually. In other words, I fully accept that Jewishness passes through the mother, but it passes through the mother because of a later rabbinic ruling, not because of a Torah teaching. We need to be really clear on this. Hashem gave the written Torah. Hashem gave the oral Torah. There's debate on what the oral Torah was. If you read like the Talmud, it's always Rabbi so-and-so said this, but Rabbi so-and-so disagreed and said that. It's hard to believe that Moses revealed something or that God revealed something to Moses where rabbis who wouldn't live for 3,000 years were having a debate. So the general consensus is that Hashem revealed the essence of the Mishnah, this essential teaching, and that out of fear that it was lost, what might be lost, the later rabbis debated what those teachings meant. And we got the Talmud. Talmud's our scripture. But that to me seems to be the origin of the Talmud. It's not a thus saith the Lord kind of a thing. It's a recording of rabbinic debates trying to clarify precepts previously believed before it was written down. 
So I think it's important that we be honest in our study. According to the Torah, lineage is, as the Kairites say, patrilineally. However, the rabbinate has the authority to change up everything. It leaves a question if biblically it passes patrilineally, which it does, what happens to a person who is patrilineally Jewish but not matrilineally Jewish? They're not Jewish, so that means that we're kicking them out. That's a problem. Rabbi Raymond Apple explains how this change occurred. In early biblical times, the criterion was Bet Av, the father's house, such as at Exodus 1 1 and Numbers 3 2. But this was superseded by the matrilineal principle, he says, derived from the Midrash Halakha, from the rabbinic writings. The Midrash Halakha on Deuteronomy 7 3 to 4, which refers to your son as the son of an Israelite mother, a rule that was accepted by all halakhic authorities, that is to say, all rabbinic authorities. Uh, and then I could offer you several different uh, verses here, but including, for instance, it's in the Shulchan Aruch at 8.5. So it's very, very well established. It's really, from a rabbinic position, there's no debate on this issue at all. And I'm not trying to cause a debate where none exist. But I want to understand that it's not the biblical teaching. A lot of times our non-Jewish friends will say, well, all I need is my Bible. And we will say, no, you also need a Talmud because the Talmud interprets the Bible. This is one reason for that. Because the rabbis, the rabbinate, has the authority to interpret the Torah for the given generation of the Jews. And this is vitally important to understand. The rabbi acknowledges here, Rabbi Raymond Apple, acknowledges here that biblically, halakha was superseded by rabbinic halakha. That's something that, for instance, Christians would be opposed completely by. How can you supersede the Bible? You can supersede the Bible because the Bible is the book of guidance given to the Jewish people, and our rabbis were given the authority to interpret it. Very different than God said it, I believe it. That settles it like you have in Christianity, parts of Christianity. But this does mean that the rabbis hold the authority not only to interpret the Torah based on the Talmud, but to even replace or supersede it when the, the sitting elders of the day feel that it's vital to do so. And they do that very, very, very hesitantly. So for Kairites, the idea that anyone might have the authority to replace what is clearly presented in the Torah is unthinkable, as it would be to Christians and others. But in rabbinic Judaism, the rabbis have this authority as the leaders of our people. I want to sort of give you a, a sort of an idea of how this would work. Um, if you look back in the Torah, when Moshe, Moshe was leading the people, his father Terry comes up and says, look, you know, you're working yourself to death. You can't do all this. You can't be the sole authority for all these people. So 70 uh, righteous people were appointed to help guide Israel. Those 70 people were later replaced, so to speak, by the rise of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the the Levites, of the priesthood of Israel. And they were superseded by the kings of Israel who were superseded by the prophets of Israel who during the Babylonian exile were superseded by the rabbis or the prushim, the Pharisees of Israel. The Pharisees during the Babylonian captivity became the, el the recognized elders of the Jewish people. Kairism, it's debated when Kairism actually began. Some people like to say that the Kairites are the natural progression from the Sadducees. That's a little bit too simple. Um, they certainly share a lot with the Sadducee sect, but they're not actually a direct lineage from the Sadducees. They actually began in the Middle Ages, as I discuss elsewhere. Um, but in the first three centuries BCE to CE, the agreement was that Judaism became matrilineally, and that was simply accepted by everybody on the authority of the rabbis. So Rabbi Apple here is saying that at least by the point of the Mishnah, at Kid, uh, Kid 312, uh, which would be roughly 200 CE, so at least by 200 CE, 
it was accepted that Jewishness must be determined by the mother's status. It was actually determined well before that, but it wasn't really codified into writing so much until the Talmud went from being an oral tradition to a written tradition. The Talmudic sages interpreted Jacob's blessing, the Lord make you as Ephraim and Manashe, in Genesis 49.20, to aver that the boy's mother was not a Gentile, but the daughter of Dinah, the sister of Joseph. So why the change? Like I said, partly at least the rabbis blamed the followers of the historic Yeshua, or Jesus of Nazareth, for this. What occurred with the development of the matrilineal descent during the days of the men of the Great Assembly and the first two centuries CE is debatable. But we know that from the time the Jews left Babylon until they started really formulating the, the Talmud in the third century CE, Judaism was being kept in perpetual uproar. You had the followers of Shammai and the followers of Hillel, for instance, debating, are we to be this totally strict following way or are we to be a more flexible view? And, are, you know, Judaism was in transition. Judaism was in upheaval to a degree because we were debating what it means to be a Jew because throughout the negative influences of Israel, we lost so very much. So then the coming of Christianity did not help this matter because you did have some Jews accepting Yeshua as the Messiah. You had people who were following him trying to come into Judaism because he was Jewish and they wanted to become Jewish, but the rabbis had to say no, that particular branch or movement of what in the first century was still part of Judaism is unacceptable. And so there was so much that had to be worked out. The rabbis had to meet and they had to set up a clear standard that everyone would know and everyone would understand. This was very, very important. What is very certain, however, is that through all of these debates within the Jewish authorities, the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish elders, what is very certain is that the popularity of the historic Jewish reformer increased an unprecedented number of Jewish conversions took place. And while these early rabbinic-based way reform movement followers of the rabbis, while they welcomed Noahides, as it says in the Christian book, Acts chapter 11, many of their followers wanted to convert to Judaism, to their new teacher's religion, rabbinic Judaism. The problem, however, for them was, of course, that the rabbis rejected the reformist movement of the apostles. And therefore, they rejected the converts of the apostles. Just like today, the rabbinic authorities, by which now I mean orthodoxy, rejects the converts of the non-orthodox. It's the same thing. They rejected the converts that were made by the way sect of Yeshua's followers, of Paul, of Peter, of James, and so on. Just like today, they reject the converts made by the non-orthodox. There has always been a very hard time in determining who is and who is not a Jew. We are very familiar with this problem today. Converts today through non-Orthodox Judaism are not themselves being rejected by the Orthodoxy, by the way. So if you're a, if you're a Gentile and you're wanting to convert and you go to your local Reform synagogue, your local conservative synagogue, your local Jewish renewal or reconstruction synagogue and you convert, and you find that you're not accepted as a Jew by 98% of orthodoxy, it's not personal. They're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting the authority of the non-orthodox rabbis to make converts, just as they rejected the authority of the apostles of Yeshua to make rabbis in the first two centuries before the creation of the Christian religion in the third century by Constantine. The rabbis rejected the authority of James, Paul, and the other Jewish leaders of the way sect to make converts because they were not following the prescribed Jewish halakha. They were not putting themselves under the authority of the rabbinic elders. And the rabbinate, the, rab the rabbinic elders, hold the authority in Judaism to determine who is and who is not halakhically Jewish. So if you come to a person who says, I'm Jewish, 
and I can get a Beit Din, three people. We're going to get together, and we're going to declare you to be Jewish. If the halakhic authorities don't accept the halakhic authority of that person, anything that person does is not going to be accepted halakhically. Does that make sense? That's really what the issue is today. Orthodoxy rejects the authority of the Reform, the Reconstructionist, Jewish Renewal, Conservative, and so on, to make converts and to do many of the rituals that they perform. They reject the, uh, the female rabbis of the non-Orthodox movement because under Orthodox Holocaust, women can't be rabbis. So all of these Jews are being rejected by the Orthodox as they're, they're real Jews, according to Orthodoxy, but they're not being accepted as rabbis. They're not being accepted as part of the authority of the rabbinic movement. Likewise, with the Kairites, as Kairism today is growing largely because of the inner internet um, and people like Nehemiah Gordon, more and more people are now claiming to be Kairite Jews. For the first time in, I think it's 500 years, the Kairite people of um, da Daly City in California made their first converts for the first time in 500 years, that any Kairite con official converts have been made. Other Kairites on the Internet argue that there actually is not a technical conversion to Judaism, that if you simply study Kairite doctrine and you agree with it, then you can start calling yourself a Kairite Jew. So the orthodoxy says, well, we can't accept these people as Jewish. It's not a rabbinically approved conversion. In fact, in some cases, it's not a conversion beyond being a conversion of heart. So we can't accept these people as converts. We can't accept the converts of non-orthodoxy. We can't accept the authority of non-orthodox rabbis. It's all very, very divided. And this growing division today makes it all but impossible to say for certain who is and who is not Jewish. I'll give you an example. I have very good friends in California who is a Messianic pastor, and his wife is a, they're both wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. I love them both dearly. Um, one of the sad things to me about leaving California was leaving them because they really are just truly wonderful people. Both Jewish by birth, both Mess are Christian by upbringing. And now he's a Messianic pastor, and she is sort of like his right-hand person helping him in this. They're raising their Jewish children up as Christians, and their Jewish children have never known the real joy of being Jewish. Are those children Jewish? Yeah, because their mom is Jewish. But they know nothing about Judaism. They know Messianic Christianity. Those Jewish boys, can they marry a traditional Jewish girl. Well, they clearly couldn't marry an Orthodox Jewish girl. You see what I'm saying? It raises so many questions. We are so, so divided today that it's just impossible. And I'm not blaming the Orthodox, by the way, for a lot of this, because the Orthodox are simply trying to defend the way for the most part. During this same post-Temple period of Judaism, our religion was establishing what would become the Judaism of the future. When the temple was destroyed, especially after Masada, rabbis got together in small huts scattered throughout the Near East, and they began to discuss what does it mean to be Jewish without a temple? Because without the temple, there's a lot of things we can't do. So what does it mean to be Jewish in a generation that doesn't have the temple, when we can't make sacrifices, when we can't go up for the festival days? What does it mean? So these Jews had to get together and formulate Christian, uh, Judaism rather, in the face of Christianity, in the face of paganism, in the face of later Islam. How do we maintain the Jewish people and the Jewish traditions into the future? The rabbis grappled with these important issues, and they developed the essential halakha that remains in effect today, the halakha of the Talmud, which was based, we believe, on this wisdom that was given to Moshe directly at Mount Sinai. It was during this same period of Talmudic development that Rabbinic Judaism fully embraced matrilineal descent and the question was considered to be completely answered. And they established Rabbinic authority as the form of Judaism. 
Now, in the Middle Ages, as I've talked elsewhere, Kairism actually had great increases and rivaled Rabbinic Judaism as far as numbers go. But Rabbinic Judaism was the original form that was reestablished after the destruction of the Second Temple. We believe, as Rabbinic Jews, that the rabbinate has the authority to make these rulings. Let's glance over here at uh, Facebook for just a moment. Uh, my friend uh, Kyle says, my speaker, oh, speakers, I hope they're working now. Uh, Kifa says, Dear Rabbi Phillips, in my family tree, my grandfather, number 13's name is Michael. And my grandfather, number 12's name is Michael. I wonder if they were Jewish. Is there a DNA test that can indicate that I have Jewish ancestry? I would be very much interested to know. I recently, there over Mother's Day, um, Ancestry.com did a, um, a big promotion where they cut their fees by a lot. Um, and so I had been going back and forth about this DNA stuff for years. I, I really wanted to get it done, but I'm thinking, I don't want to give my DNA to somebody. You know? But I finally went ahead and did it. Um, I got to tell you, I personally was very disappointed by the results. Um, there is nothing specific, hardly. They will get some general parts of the world. My ancestors came from the British Island, and they came from Bulgaria, from Lithuania, and from some of the areas in Europe. Um, but there's really just wasn't very much detailed information. People who are more, I'm more Ashkenazi, I guess you'd say, but people who are, who are Sephardic, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Sephardic, people who are sem really hardcore Semites, Semitic Jews, their DNA will tend to be more affirmative. But based on Ancestry.com, at least, I would say that this DNA test is next to useless. Um, I got nothing useful out of it. Um, there was almost no information about anything. And if you want to try to track something, they'll tell you that, you know, there's a possibility that you've got these third, fourth, and fifth cousins. But if you want to get a hold of them, you have to pay, I think it's like 20 bucks a month or something to open up things. If you want to go internationally, you have to pay more money. I got to be honest with you. To me, Ancestry.com looks like a money-making scam. There was really nothing to it. And if you got a DNA test done, and if your DNA test showed that you are 100% you know, from Israel, Jewish, no question. I don't even think they could do that, but if they did. 100% Jewish for sure, and you were to go to a traditional rabbi with your test results, the rabbi is not going to accept it and say, okay, you're Jewish. To be accepted as Jewish, your mother has to be um, Jewish, period. If your birth mother is not Jewish, with a few exceptions, like with the Igbo in Africa, I have a lot of Igbo friends. I'm very happy to have them as my friends. They're often listening here. And if you're an Igbo, welcome, glad you're listening. Um, they're an exception. And the Manashe of India is another exception. But as a general statement, if your birth mother was not halakhically Jewish, you're not going to be accepted as Jewish. If your birth father was Jewish, you're not going to be accepted as Jewish unless your mother was. Um, what can happen if you could absolutely prove through a DNA test, a rabbi, assuming it's on the, the mother's side, the family, you're, you didn't say if it's your father's father, grandfather, or your mother's grandfather. Um, if it's on the mother's side, you might be able to find a rabbi who would say, based on that, I will assist you in formally converting. And maybe if you already have knowledge, we can make it go a little faster, a little bit easier. If you are an Igbo from a certain very, very limited tribal area, if you are an Indian of Manashe origins from a very, very certain small little area of Israel, um, of India rather, if you are um, from uh, certain tribes among Islam, um, in, I think it's in uh, Afghanistan where they're at. Uh, so there, there are exceptions. But Jewishness has to be conferred by a rabbi, by three rabbis, actually. A Beit Din has to rule on your individual case and say, yes, we accept that you are, in fact, Jewish. If your birth mother is not Jewish, 
getting that done is more of a hassle than formally converting, to be honest with you. Um, converting takes somewhere between one to three or four years, depending on how you convert. And as I said a few minutes ago, if you're going to convert, it's worth the extra time and money, and it's a lot more money, generally speaking, to convert Orthodox. If you convert Orthodox, all the non-Orthodox are going to accept your conversion, and most of the Orthodox will, depending on who you go through. Now, there are certain Hasidic sects that will only accept people who convert through their movement. So you want to ask a lot of questions before you approach your rabbi for a conversion. If you have a sense, for instance, if you want to be Satmar and be accepted by Satmar, you're going to have to convert through Satmar. Um, so you want to do a lot of research before you decide how to convert or who to go through for your conversion. As I'll share when I go on with this, in my opinion, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, and according to Orthodox Halakha, every Jew, present, past, or future, including all converts, were personally present at Mount Sinai and personally accepted the Torah when offered by Moshe. I'm, actually, I'm going to discuss that as we continue. Um, but that's basically your answer. The DNA testing is fascinating, I hear. <laughs> Ancestry.com was really a disappointment to me. I spent a fair amount of money and really got nothing useful out of it. Um, but um, you really, if your birth mother is not Jewish, DNA is interesting, but convert to Judaism if, if you want to be accepted as Jewish. Uh, Jack says, God, maker of heavens and the earth. Amen, Jack. That's very, very true. All right. Uh, so, uh, Prakash Paul is also with us. Uh, welcome, Prakash. Um, so, let's continue here. So, under rabbinic Judaism, which is today about 98% of all of Judaism, observant or not, orthodox or not, almost everybody today is falls under the umbrella of rabbinic Judaism. Uh, oh, I should mention, by the way, just for accuracy's sake, some of the non-orthodox movements are now saying that if your father is Jewish and your mother is not, and if you were raised in a Jewish home, so you were raised Jewish, they will accept you as Jewish. The orthodox will not, but some of the non-orthodox will. I, sh I should have mentioned that. Uh, so that's another question. Who is Jewish and who is not? As is so often the case, what is right really depends on your belief system and your party preferences. To some person, some people, this person, I'm thinking more politics now, is virtually the savior of the world. And to other person, that person is flat out evil, incarnate. It depends on where you're coming from as to what is right and true. The rabbis have the authority to establish rules for their followers, but even the rabbis cannot dictate to those of the other movements or sects other than to say, we don't accept you. So an orthodox rabbi can say, we don't accept female rabbis. A conservative rabbi who happens to be female can smile and say, well, you know, God bless you anyway. I'm a rabbi. They don't have the authority overall to reject that female rabbi. They can only reject that female rabbi within their sect. Likewise, if a conservative or reformed Beit Din does a conversion, orthodoxy can't really say anything about it except that we don't accept it. So, if you accept that Orthodox rabbis, traditional Jewish rabbis, hold the authority to govern Jewish life, which is the traditional belief, then they certainly have the authority to change the calendar, to define Jewishness, to transform the religion from patrilineal to matrilineal, if you believe in the authority of Orthodox rabbis. If you believe the laws of Torah are sacrosanct as written that they can never be changed and that no one has any authority to even alter them in the slightest, then frankly the Kairites are closer to being correct. 
Because biblically speaking, Jewishness does pass through the father, not the mother. In the end, and this is where I was fiction to go a moment ago, in the end, when all is said and done, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. Each Jew, and each non-Jew for that matter, has to examine their belief system. Every Jew has to examine our holy religion and our practices within it and determine our own beliefs accordingly. But then again, that's exactly what the Kairites do. Micah 6.6 6 says, With what shall I come before Hashem? With what shall I bow myself before the Most High God? Shall I come before Hashem with burnt offerings of yearling calves? Will Hashem be pleased with me if I offer thousands of rams and myriad streams of oil? Shall I give my firstborn child for my sins, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Hashem has told you, O man, what is good and what he requires of you? Do justice, love loving kindness, and walk discreetly with your God. I'm a member of a group that is called Der Altvig Hasidus. Hasidus is based on the teachings of the Besht, the Bel Shem Tov. But the Bel Shem Tov didn't really bring anything new. What the Bel Shem Tov did is he restored the spirit that we find really in the Torah. The idea of dancing before Hashem, the idea of joy before Hashem, the idea of a personal loving relationship with Hashem. And in this, there's a very, very, th thin, a very, very thin line to be made. The rabbis, according to rabbinic Judaism, and I personally fully accept this, the rabbis have the authority to make the halakha. The rabbis have the authority to tell us this is how you do it and this is how you don't do it. And yet, each rabbi is different and each hasid is different. Some focus on love, on joy, on dancing. Some focus on feeding the poor and the homeless. Some focus on helping to house people. Some focus on spending their entire lives in a yeshiva bent over sacred scrolls and studying them. Some spend their time on the internet teaching and making videos. Some people don't even like the internet and they think it's sort of like this really dangerous thing that no religious person should have anything to do with. We are a very, very, very diverse people. There are simply too many people today running around telling everybody else how they should be Jewish. The Chavetz Chaim addressed the reason for the destruction of the Second Temple. As Hasids, and I would think all Jews, but as Hasids particularly, we believe that there are three fundamental principles involved in knowing God, in serving God properly. And it's all based on imuna. The word imuna doesn't quite translate into English. It's usually translated as faith, but because of the idea of blind faith, which would be an additive to the word faith, it's not quite clear. Imuna is active faith. Imuna is active trust. I may believe that if I walk in front of that truck, I'm probably going to get killed. But until I walk in front of the truck, I don't really know. It's Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat. Is the cat dead or alive inside the box? You're not going to know until you open the box. You're not going to experience your Amuna until you exercise your Amuna. If you exercise your Amuna, you will see whether or not Hashem is there. If a person simply says, I believe in God, but they don't do anything about it, what is that? It's nothing. I believe the sky is blue, but it has no impact on my life, and sometimes it contradicts because I look up and the sky looks black, or the sky looks purple, or the sky looks yellow, or whatever. Um, 
I believe that if I hop off a cliff, I'm probably going to die. But unless I hop off, there's a possibility that I wouldn't die. So in the same way, we have to take a leap of faith. We have to act out our Amuna. What's that got to do with the topic? This. The rabbis, according to rabbinic Judaism, have the authority to determine Jewishness. I have a lot of friends on Facebook who write me and say, uh, well, in fact, like, uh, like was done here, uh, I, I shared this comment by my friend Kifa, and thank you for that comment. It was a very good, very important comment. I have people in my family that I think may be Jewish, and I may be Jewish. A lot of people have this innate sense they want to be Jewish. If you want to be Jewish, there is no back door to being Jewish. If you're Jewish, you were personally present at Mount Sinai, and you personally accepted the Torah when, when Moshe offered it to you, according to the rabbis. So, think about it this way. If you were personally present at Mount Sinai, and you personally accepted the Torah as offered by Hashem, you're Jewish. You might not be living in a Jewish family, you might not know anything about Judaism, but technically you were there. That's not really what it means to be Jewish, exactly. If you want to be accepted as Jewish, and that's really what you're asking for, and this isn't directed just to Kipa, this, but that's what people are asking for, is you want to be accepted as part of the tribe. There's only two ways you're going to be accepted as part of the tribe. That is, your birth mother, not your adoptive mother, unless you, you know, there's other processes, but your birth mother is Jewish, or you went to a recognized Beit Din, a recognized religious court, and they accept you as Jewish. Being Jewish, you really could say, means that you were present at Mount Sinai and accepted the, the burden of Torah. Being accepted as Jewish, you have to confirm to Jewish law. That means being born of a Jewish mother, or formally converting to a bait den. So DNA testing, um, studying Torah, you know, you start to wear a kippah, you start wearing tefillin, you start laying, uh, I mean, la laying tzitzit, you start laying tefillin, you put a mezuzah on your doorpost, you learn Hebrew, you take a trip to Israel. None of that makes you, it makes you Jewish. In fact, if you're living like a Jew and you're not and you're observing all of our holidays and you're observing all of these things and in some ways you're actually sort of moving further away from Hashem because you're trying to usurp our religion. If you want to be Jewish and your mother's not Jewish, you got to go to a recognized Beit Din. If you want to convert Orthodox, you're going to almost have to move into an Orthodox community. I'd probably say 99% of people who convert Orthodox, and there aren't that many of them, most people convert non-Orthodox, have to relocate so they can live within walking distance of the Orthodox synagogue they're going to be going through. Before you do that, you want to talk to that rabbi, and you want to go through the process of rejection, which you will be rejected a few times, probably. You want to be allowed to enter into a conversion course, because not all rabbis are willing to help people convert and not all rabbis are willing to accept any given individual as a convert. So it would really be a shame if you sold everything and moved across the country, moved into an, an, an Orthodox neighborhood and went into debt to buy a house or rent an apartment and then find out, sorry, the local Orthodox rabbi isn't going to help you convert. And again, if you convert, but you really wanted to be over here, make sure they're going to accept that conversion. It's a matter of social acceptance. It's a matter of being accepted into a given family. Uh, conversion is. This, is on, this problem is only going to get worse as we go into the future. Now, if you ask the anti-Semites who is a Jew, Anti-Semite isn't going to make a distinction between Orthodox and non-Orthodox. The anti-Semite isn't going to say, 
your Satmar, your Breslov, your Chabad, your uh, Misnoyim, your, your anti-Hasidic, your Orthodox, your Jewish renewal, you know, you have payas, you don't have payas, you wear a kippah, you don't wear a kippah, your mother's Jewish, your father's Jewish. Anti-Semites don't care. They understand what it means to be Jewish in a very different way. And they're not going to like you, period. It doesn't matter that the Orthodox rabbis say you're not Jewish. You're Jewish, and they're going to do whatever they do to Jews when they get a chance. We, however, are so filled with infighting that it's ridiculous. Um, I started to mention this a moment ago. I think it slipped my mind. Um, the Chavetz Chaim was addressing the reason why the Second Temple was destroyed. So as I said, we have the three principles of Amuna. Everything that happens happens by the hand of God. If you accept that, Amuna, that's that act of faith, and you put your active faith into that, does that mean that Hashem personally is directly involved in every single thing? You're out in the backyard and you stump your toe. Did Hashem make you stump your toe, or were you simply not paying attention? For a religious Jew, the Amuna says that Hashem made you stump your toe, that Hashem does everything in your life. Now, if it's not the case, you haven't really lost anything. You should be more careful when you're walking in the backyard. But for the religious Jew, everything that happens, happens by the will of God. And everything that happens, happens for your ultimate good. Not necessarily your short-term good, but your ultimate good. And the ultimate good of all existence. So, if you stump your toe, how could that possibly be for your good? It could be. You have to, you're going to have to think about that, but it could be. Everything that happens, happens by, the, by God's hand and happens for a reason, for your good. That's the second point. The third point is that by understanding that, you can attach yourself more fully with Hashem. So the Chavetz Chaim is pondering why was the second temple destroyed? Was the second temple destroyed because the Romans were so anti-Semitic? Was it destroyed because the Romans were just stronger than we were? Well, that may be true on both counts, but that's not why it was destroyed. The Havitz Chaim determines that the reason that Hashem had the temple destroyed was because of Jewish infighting. Because this sect said, I'm better than that sect. And this person said, I'm more observant than you are. You're a heathen. You're a heretic because you don't put on your tefillin the way I do. Because you don't do this. You don't do this like I do. You're not observant enough. You're not Jewish. I don't accept your converts. I don't accept your rabbis. I don't accept, I don't accept. This bickering infighting, that, according to Havitz Chaim, is why the temple was destroyed. Now, here we are. 2,000 plus years later, actually not plus, about 2,000 years later, here we are saying, I want to see the temple rebuilt. I want to see Mashiach come. I want to see God as king of the universe, Mashiach sitting on the throne of his father David. And as a Jew, I want to see these things. And yet, we as a people, collectively, Orthodox and non-Orthodox, Hasids and non-Hasids, we are doing the exact same thing that the Chavetz Chaim said caused the Second Temple to be destroyed. We're eating our own. This ought not to be, but this is. What's the solution? Well, there's the rub. You don't want to tell pious traditional Jews that Torah observance doesn't matter. You don't want to tell non-Orthodox Jews that eh, it doesn't matter, you know, eat pork, do anything you want to do, Hashem doesn't care, it doesn't matter, you're just as Jewish as a Haredi living in Mir Sharim. The Haredi living in Mir Sharim may be anti-Israel, some are, some aren't, whereas the non-Orthodox Jew is totally pro-Israel. I mean, there's, there's good and bad on all sides of the coin. There's strengths and weaknesses on all sides of the coin. None of us are doing it right. Some are better, quote, 
in this area, some are better in that area. So what do we do? No, I think what we do is we allow people who want to play games to play their games. My Rebbe, Rabbi Aaron Nachman bin Chaim of the House of Seven Beggars, established Duralt Big Hasidus as a way of trying to get back to the original spirit advocated by the Belshim and the Belshim Tov particularly trying to get past all of this judgmentalism, all the legalism, all the he said, she said. Try to get back to the spirit of what it means to be a Jew. Now, we accept these basic premises, you know, Jewish is matrilineal, and, you know, we accept the Torah, we accept the Holocaust, all this stuff. But try to get back to what it really means to be Jewish. Oh, good, Kel, you found out what the problem was with your Bluetooth. Good. Um... Try to find out what it means to be Jewish. What it means to be a servant of God. If you're not Jewish, you can serve the same God we serve. Because there's only one God. Find out what it means to be a person of faith. And live your faith. Live your faith in love. Live your faith in joy. Remember Genesis 12.3. God will bless those who bless Israel and will curse those who curse Israel. Um, if you're an anti-Semite, God's not going to bless you. I'm sorry. But live your religious beliefs, whatever they are, in a spirit of peace and love and joy and worship God according to your best knowledge. Hashem will look at your heart. And Hashem will bless you accordingly. And if you're one of those Jews who is being told that you're not really Jewish. And notice how I said that. If you're one of those Jews who is not being accepted as Jewish by someone, don't worry about it. We're all rejected by somebody. And such people really don't alter your situation as a Jew if you're practicing religion. So make sure that you... Um, Make sure that you are to the best, of, I'm talking to Jews now, make sure to the best of your knowledge that you are following the halakha honestly in a way that works for you according to your knowledge and your minhag, your traditions. And have as your desire to ever grow closer to Hashem. And you're going to be okay. Rabbi Nachman of Brezlov said, you know what? A little is also good. And he said the Torah wasn't given to the perfect angels. The Torah was given to fallible people. And Rabbi Nachman says, pick a point of halakha that speaks to you. Find one law, one aspect of halakha that really speaks to you personally. Fulfill that mitzvah to the best of your ability. Now keep all the other ones, but really do that one right and move forward. When you've really got that one down, you'll be ready to pick up something else. But being a Jew is not really crossing a finish line during this life. It's crossing the finish line in the Olam Haba. And it's not really even crossing the finish line into the Olam Haba. Because in the Olam Haba, the world to come, we're also going to continue growing. So like Micah said, love God. Love your fellow human beings. Love the animals. Be a caretaker of the earth as Adam was ordered to be. Be good. Be joyful. Be happy. And you will know God. Regardless of the label that some authority slaps on your chest. If you have any more questions, that'll be cool. Kale, uh, Kyle is still having, uh, Kale or Kyle? I'm going to go with Kyle. K-A-I-L, Kyle. Um, I'm going to, uh, still working on your, your Bluetooth with Verizon. I, believe me, I can relate. I've had so many computer and phone problems, I can't tell you. But it's wonderful when it works. <laughs> So anyway, thank you all very much for watching, um, and uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, even after the video is over, I invite you to share them on the chat screen here at Facebook. 
Uh, all of my videos are also posted on my YouTubes and at allfaith.com. If you have any questions, do let me know. We're going to um, finish with a different song because usually I'll just play a little snippet of a song at the beginning and then I'll end with a different one. The song that I ended with was a really beautiful, interesting version of Am Yisrael Chai. I'm going to close with a different version of Am Yisrael Chai. Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. Despite what our enemies do to us, and despite what we do to ourselves, which is often almost as bad, if not worse, as a people, we live. As a people, the Jewish people continue. As Hashem says in Malachi, I, the Lord, am not a human, am not a man, therefore, that I should lie. Therefore, you children of Israel continue to exist. We continue to exist by the will and by the mercy of Hashem. Hashem alone determines that we continue to live. I'm Yisrael Chai. Thanks for watching. This is Shlomo Karabat. I'm a trial, 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 Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time.